Hello people, Zach here again today, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about quantum mechanics. Um, in, in particular, I want to provide an example of a, a physical situation that I think is um, you can derive all of the principles of quantum mechanics from uh, that's really intuitive uh, and insightful. And, and part of the reason why I want to do this is because I think that quantum mechanics has been so taken over by mathematics that the, the ideas that they're conveying um, physically or illogical and, um, and and anyway let's just go ahead and get started uh, and you'll see where we're going with this so uh, assume that you're making a peer-to-peer -peer first person shooter video game and uh, so in this game you have like a hundred different players that are in a session and they all have to uh, synchronize their states um, now on each individual player's machine they have an idea of where the other players are at in the game and which direction they're facing and like what animation state that they're in. Um, they have an idea of where all of the particles, like the bullets and stuff like that, are in the game, um, where the different particle simulations are at, what pickups have been picked up, what haven't. Um, and so the, the problem is that because they're all supposed to be communicating with each other, because um, it's supposed to be one session where all these people are playing together, um, they have to synchronize all these states, but they can't do it infinitely fast. There is a time delay between uh, the time it takes for one player to like shoot, uh, fire a trigger on his own machine and for the other players to recognize that that player had done that. Um, so sub subjectively, um, emphasis on the word subjective here, if you were to ask any individual player, um, where is this object, like where is player two, um, you would get a single definitive answer because that it is well defined as to where that thing is at in the universe, like what state it's in. But if you were to try to ask the entire network objectively, um, where is this particular projectile, you could get potentially as many different answers as there are players in the game. Um, now that doesn't mean you're going to get definitively as many answers. That's a, that's a probability thing. Like what ends up happening is you might have like 80% of uh, players might say that it's at um, one position, and then 10% might say it's at another, 5% another, and you like you just get like this almost like bell curve like situation. Um, but but the general idea stands is that like in in objectively in terms of the network, if you're to try to talk about one thing. Um, it exists in a state of superposition, and you really don't know where it's at until you at, uh, until you collapse that by like turning it into something that is subjective. Uh, and, and this idea of uh, subjectivity and objectivity is the basis of quantum mechanics. Um, quantum mechanics really has nothing to do with quantization per se. Um, and, and just like some things that always used to get on my nerves, like if you if you watch any courses on um, or read any material on quantum mechanics, they, they show certain examples that keep cropping up all the time. Um, one example is the, the double slit experiment where they say like this single particle, um, it goes through both slits and then like interferes with itself. Or they might say like uh, something like a particle take or photon takes every possible path through the entire universe and it just happens to be like the, the shortest possible path was the one that... Um, the one that it takes. And I think it's like the Grangian mechanics is like the, the idea that that's based on. Um, but these, these are all false because like the problem where these interpretations come from is that they assume that there is an objective particle and there is not an objective particle. There is um, there's an objective observation, but there are only subjective particles. There are, um, for every individual thing, like if like a particle going through this machine, there is potentially as many different existences of that particle as there are observers of that particle. Um, and so you end up with a situation like uh, what happens if one observer observes that a particle moved through the right slit before the other ones even know that it traveled through which slit it traveled through? Um, well, they can change their state and the other observers can react to that observer changing its state um, before they react to the other par uh, particle being observed. So now like you end up with a situation where now you have um, interference because like the observation of which location it went through came before it actually observed where it came through, um, if that makes any sense. Uh, but there's also these ideas like, uh, like, like the Schrodinger's cat experiment. Like they say like, well, if you have a cat in a box and inside this box there's like a toxin that's uh, hooked up to this machine that uh, triggers if an uh, atom decays, um, and that atom could decay at any moment in time 
like over the course of like a billion years so you don't really know if the cat is alive or dead or whatever now most people when they try to interpret this they try to say that think they think of this in terms of like there being an objective cat and so like the only way they could possibly interpret this is if they say that there is like, like an infinite worlds thing and that the cat or that the cat exists and is both alive and dead um which from an objective perspective makes sense but subjectively speaking no the the cat is either dead or alive uh, the thing is that the the observers of the box or the cat in the box don't agree on where this at so it's actually kind of an undefined thing it's a probabilistic thing is what it is um and this idea of subjectivity and objectivity actually ties in uh, really nicely with the topic of my last video, which had to do with the subjectivity of reality. Um, and I, I had brought this... Uh, I, I did the title of that video um, under my true first name, which is Joshua, but I normally go by my middle name, just so you know. It's, it's not like I copied that from somewhere. That was... Um, that presentation was actually only as professional-looking as it was because it was for an assignment for my uh, philosophy class. Um... But anyway, um, the the topic I was talking about uh, had to do with subjective and objective reality in that as well. Um, and philosophers throughout time have always had this fallacy that they keep doing, and I see this all the time. They, they try saying that everything that is mental, everything that is subjective is unreal, and then everything that is physical, which is ob supposed to be objective, is real. But the problem is that you can't observe the objective. Anything, any, the second that you observe the objective, it becomes subjective. Everything that is physical has to be filtered through your mind. So to deny your own mind automatically discredits the physical as well. So now you can't trust any of your experiences. So the way that I take as a solution to this is I say, well, no, actually all experiences are real. And so this includes the mental. Um, and, and the consequence of this is like... Um, if you were to have such control over like your own mind that you could vividly and lucidly augment your subjective reality at a whim, um, like you could literally just like imagine yourself as if you were like in a lucid dream flying, that this would be indistinguishable from living in an objective universe where the same as possible. Uh, and this kind of just like leads into my whole philosophy um, of um, like the nature of, of the universe and like the spiritual aspects of it as well. Um, I'm kind of in line with um, a lot of ideas that are um, like hermetic, uh, the idea of like collective mind or like the uh, Plato, Plato's um, world of forms or um, the, the idea of like the, 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 the great work, like the idea of uh, being perfection of the mind as being the, the highest work that one can achieve. Um, but anyway, um, I'm kind of going off on a tangent here. I just really wanted to bring this up because I, it, it really bothers me every time I see stuff like this. Like, and, and I think that it helps people if they understand the way that this works to understand certain things like, um, like hologram theory. Like string theorists think that the universe is a hologram. And that's one of those things that's like, well, no, but actually, yes. <laughs> it, because, like, objectively, it's not a hologram, but subjectively, it kind of is, because there's, like, a unique version of you for every observer in the universe, or, or at least potentially as many unique versions. So some of them could be duplicates. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that I also wanted to bring up, too, I, I mentioned this in my naturalphilosophy.org uh, previous post, and it, it was a bit long, so I didn't... Um, I don't think that a lot of people kind of read what I got and kind of just um, congealed that within their mind and kind of like un understood it that well. Um, if you've ever seen the movie, um, it's 2014, it's called Lucy. It's about this um, this woman. She uh, she gets abducted and then like they put these drugs inside of her stomach and then... Um, they start the leak and because of the nature of the drug it like unlocks more and more of her mind until eventually she like reaches 100% of her mind and be like there's like this huge like this like mind blowing moment where like she it appears as though she creates the entire universe um and the I bring this movie up um and you might be asking like why are you bringing up a science fiction film like this is this is silly like you're doing pseudoscience right now but I'll get to that in a moment because I, I when I I actually hadn't watched this movie. I, I still haven't watched the whole movie. I actually only um, watched like one or two clips of the movie um, 
because um, someone was listening to something that I had said and mentioned the movie in passing, and so like I just went to check it out, and like I saw these two scenes in that were in this movie, and like instantly like my mind might up because like I'm not sure if this writer um, is really deep in physics or like metaphysics, or if they just managed to somehow. Um, lucky enough to pull off a triple somersault and land it perfectly i don't know uh, but there's this one particular scene where she's standing in a room um with like a team of other scientists and she's like morphing her hand into all these different shapes and she has like this pen that she's flipping around and she says that uh, humanity since the dawn of mankind has always defined everything in terms of unit one everything in terms of one and that one plus one equals two and that's really all we've learned and then she says that um uh, but one plus one is never equal to. And to like the shock of everyone who's a mathematician who would hear this would just like instantly be like, all right, this is stupid. And just like shut off right then and there. But hold on for a moment. Um, so she turns around and she shows this uh, image of this car and like behind her and she starts flipping her hand across and the car starts speeding faster and faster and faster until it completely vanishes from existence. And she says that time gives meaning to the existence of all things. Um, and then Morgan Freeman's like, time is unity, you know. Um... Now, the way that I interpreted this was very different from what I think that a lot of people interpret this as. Um, what she is talking about, in my opinion, is subjective versus objective reality. Um, to say that 1 plus 1 equals 2, suppose, for example, that you're um, in that video game scenario that I mentioned earlier, that a single pay uh, player, um, there is a button that they press that duplicates something, right? Like, uh, if they press this one switch right here, like, this box is duplicated immediately. After they press that bu that button, there is a brief period of time um, during which some of the observers on the network don't know that that button was pressed, and some of them do. So, objectively speaking, on the entire network, um, 1 plus 1 is not equal to 2, because there is no 1. There are as many boxes as there are, or potentially as many boxes as there are uh, players in the game. So when she presses their button of time, it is 1 plus 1 is equal to 1 and 2. Um, and it's probabilistically entirely, and I think that's what she's, ta what she's talking about in one particular clip. And this is further justified by the car, uh, the car example that she does when she turns around, when she's speeding the car up faster and faster. Um, because within a subjective reality, what she realizes is that if you had any player that was on that network whose machine could run infinitely fast, um, that no other player would be able to actually know of its existence. Um, because it moves so fast that the other players on the network can't react to that thing moving, if that, if that makes any sense. Uh, the, what allows 1 plus 1 to equal 2 is time, like a, a delay in time. And so when she says that time is what gives meaning to existence, this is also ties in with an idea that I covered several videos ago um, where I was talking about being, um, which is like the animating principle of things, um, does not act without reason and does not react without cause, and that the reason of being to act uh, is to become, or they're basically, they're, they're trying to seek out a potential future state. And so what requires be the act of becoming itself, the change, is uh, exists within the space of time. So without time is actually what gives meaning to being. That is actually a true statement. Um, so th this is, like I said, when I watched this movie, like my eyes just kind of lit up. I was like, whoa. Like, <laughs> like, I don't know who this guy is, but he's either like into some really deep metaphysical stuff or he just like somehow managed to pull off a perfect somersault. Um, and that kind of lends uh, as well to... Uh, the, the ending of the movie as well, I also have a unique interpretation of. Um, and I, I'd mentioned this before about this idea that uh, all origin theories are supernatural. And um, and so a lot of people, when they watch the ending of the movie, like they see her and she's like, she's hooking herself up to these different machines and stuff and like her whole body's turning black and uh, she starts traveling back through time. Like she's, she sweeps her hand back and she sees, watches this city being deconstructed back until it's like in the old times. Um, she heads all the way back to the time where like there's like these Indians walking the plains and then she heads all the way back and then she, she stops in front of like this, uh, looks like a first like um, primordial humans per se. Um, and she, she touches fingers with um, with the thing, which kind of like, a, it, it was supposed to be representative of like the painting of Michelangelo where God touches um, the finger of Adam. And then uh, instantly like she zooms out and she like, it, 
she's what witnesses like the birth of the planet and it goes all the way back and she like she sees the, the the big bang itself like goes all the way back to the big bang and then she goes beyond the big bang and sees like all of these different tunnels and stuff and so um i i looked up a, a couple of different interpretations that i've seen of this scene from other people and i i don't think that anyone has interpreted this the same way that i i interpreted it i mean and i could be wrong if someone's seen this um they're free to correct me um but what she is doing in that scene it is not implying that she objectively um started the entire universe and that she objectively was the cause of um mankind's intelligence that's completely paradoxical and makes no sense um and that should be obvious what is actually happening in that scene is that she's bootstrapping her own existence she's realizing that her entire reality is subjective and so she is becoming the cause of everything in her own existence and um, a, a good analogy for this um, if you're familiar with like Unix operating systems and uh, the C programming language um, a lot of people might be aware that like the Unix operating system was written in C and so the the question becomes like which came first like Unix or the C compiler uh, and the answer is neither. Um, what actually ended up happening is that uh, Unix was originally written in assembly, and then after they wrote a C compiler, um, Ken Thompson and Dennis, Rich, uh, Dennis Ritchie, they rewrote everything in C, and then uh, so then Unix was now entirely portable. Um, so then the question says, okay, smart guy, um, which came first, Unix or the assembler? And this is, again, one of those uh, answers. It's like, well, actually, what ended up happening is, is that the people who were... Um, people originally had to sit down with like paper and pencil write out these programs on paper hand translate them in the machine code and punch them into like register panels on the machine so they had to <laughs> so in a sense the assembler predated, predated the Unix system but now you, you start to notice this pattern where like um you have people now who are writing hands like the you have these so-called it's, it's supernatural to the state of the system you would never in a million years from like the nature of like in being inside of a unix system suspect that the system could have originated um from a bunch of people writing in pencil and paper that that just that isn't something that you would subject that is entirely supernatural to the nature of the system and uh so this is what i was talking about this idea of uh, origin stories is that once a system has been bootstrapped the nature of the or i mean the origin of the system is uh incapable of being deduced from the nature of the system and so all origin theories it doesn't matter which they are are going to be supernatural and um, and then i take that and i say well like well where do we witness this in nature because like the nature of science is supposed to be empiricism so like we're not we shouldn't be creating these hypothetical universes um like saying like leptogenesis or whatever where like the higgs field breaks down and like now there's like this entirely different system of um of physics that is different from everything that we know um, and has never been observed and can't be created like it, it's unable to be observed but it's entirely mathematical so we know if the math must be true it must be true no no that's pseudoscience but empirically we do actually witness a supernature and it happens within the mental and so this is like goes full circle into this idea of subjective realities like action has to precede reaction uh, the subjective has dominance over the objective it is above the objective um, so anyway uh, I think I'm going to cut this video off around here because I think I've covered all of the the ideas that I wanted to cover uh, anyway uh, Thank you for watching. If you have any criticisms or if you um, any comments on this, uh, go ahead and leave them below. And uh, thank you for watching.